our God Sarah is unstoppable. unstoppable. Awesome. <laughs> That's good stuff. Well, we are, we are, I'm, I'm anxious to, to jump into our, our series. I want to, I want to share God's word with you, but, but before we do, this is kind of a, it's attached to the series. You're going to see why. I want to take a few minutes. I, I announced on Facebook this, this week that we have some big announcements and this is it right here. And so I hope you're all very, very excited as I am to share it with you. Yeah, we got a drum roll. Awesome. <laughs> so... So, so here it is. We've been, we've been talking, starting last week, about how faithful God is. And so uh, we could talk about it all day long, but we want to see it, right? I know that, th- that, the, that people live by faith, not by sight, but we want to see. I want to see God's faithfulness. And I can tell you right now that what I'm going to share with you guys here right now is evidence, clear evidence of his faithfulness. I have been praying, and a lot of us have been, for God to send people to help. God's word says that the harvest is out there, man, and, but the workers are few. And so pray to the Lord of the harvest to send the workers, right? So we've been, I've been, listen, I don't know about what y'all have been doing every day, but that's something I do. That's a staple of my spiritual diet. I'm exercising that prayer all the time because doing it alone is not a lot of fun. And so I'm telling you right now, God is faithful. You just look at your neighbor and say, God is faithful. faithful. How about in unison? God God is faithful. faithful. I'd like for Jay and Ramon to please come up here. Please join me. Please join me. Being called to the office. <laughs> Come here, Jerry. <laughs> awesome. Well, you, you, you guys all, I'm sure most people in the room know this is Jay and this is Ramon. If you're new, hey, this is Jay and this is Ramon. Amen. So, so th- these are tremendous men of God. We all love them. I've grown to love them, brothers in the faith. And... Uh, this is evidence right here of God's faithfulness. These guys, have, yeah, these guys have been faithfully serving here at the church now for quite some time. Um, great examples of the faith. When you look in the scripture and it talks about what leaders in the church should be, that's all you need to do is look at these two gentlemen and you see how they act and how they live and the example that they set for all of us. And so... And so um, I, they're an answer to prayer. They've been teaching, they've been praying, they've been leading, all with no title, all with no recognition, asking for none, just want to come and help. I've been doing this now for a long time, and I'll tell you what, the, the people that come in and say, God sent me and I'm here to help you, run, Amen. run, right? Amen. But the ones who quietly just do, there's your leader. That's what we look for. And these guys are exemplary. And so I am super, super, super happy, super excited to see God's faithfulness in flesh. And I'm happy to announce that um, right now we're going to do as the scriptures would do. And um, Jay will, as of this moment, become an, an, an official elder of Revolution Church. He has... He has served as a senior pastor for well over 20 years and came in and asked nothing, nothing deserving of his title or his experience. He'll gladly take the trash out. And that's a leader. The greatest will be the least. And he shows it. And Ramon, same thing. Ramon, you may not know it, But he prays for you and prays for you and prays for you and prays for you. That's just who he is. He prays. He prays for me. He prays for you. If he doesn't even know you and you don't know him, just know this. Ramon's praying for you. And and Ramon, he loves the word of God. He loves me. I love him. He's a tremendous teacher. If you've been up here on a Wednesday night when he's led, very gifted. Loves the word of God. Knows the word of God. And he, he did something. He came to me 
a while back and said he wanted to start a small group. I never asked him to do that. Churches have small group ministries. Let me just, I'm, I may be shooting myself in the foot here, but you know why we have official small group ministries? Do you know why? why? Because you won't start them. <laughs> when you read the Bible in Acts chapter 2, did they have a small group ministry? Amen. Well, they did, but they didn't know when they had to ask them to do it. They just did it. Right? When you love Jesus, you just don't, you're not satisfied with just here tonight. When y'all leave, you go to someone's house, you do it some more. That's what happens. And that's what they did. But I understand that's not the way it's working all the time. And so he started a small group because he sensed that that's what he's supposed to do. They also asked me if it was okay to do it so he understands authority. He's an awesome man of God. And we want to start a small group ministry. We, we, it is our desire and has been for a long time to see you grow in your relationship with the Lord vertically, right? And then grow in your relationship with one another horizontally. And that doesn't just happen coming here to this. That's why Tanner quoted me saying, if you come to a service and that's it, that's lame. Because it is. Right. right? There's more to this. There's more to our faith than coming to a service. It's a life lived together in service to the Lord and to each other. And so... As of right now, we're going to pray as the scriptures would say to do. But as of right now, as we do this, Ramon will now be your small group pastor who will be, yeah, you can clap for him. And he and I have been working closely on putting together some framework on what a revolution small group in your home would look like. You don't have, it's not in, it's not in like permanent ink where you, it's like you got to do this, you know, and march the exact, right? But we give you some framework on what it would look like so it can be um, intentional and effective and, and profitable for the kingdom of God. And so we're almost done with that, but Ramon will be overseeing the launching of small groups in homes and then overseeing and making sure that the people in those groups are being led well, cared for, prayed for. If you have a, an event in your community, like if, let's just say that, Susan, you're having one at your house and people are coming and you guys want to do a service, something in your neighborhood, but you need the resources of the church, this is who you would contact. And if we have it available, we will come alongside and help you. So he's going to oversee all that, make sure that they're healthy. If anyone's got some issues that need addressing, we need to, to help in some way. That's the guy. Okay? So, now, um, in the scriptures, um, when, when leaders of the church, like in Acts chapter 13, it says that Saul, Paul, and Barnabas, that the Holy Spirit had appointed them for a special work. And so, what happened was they laid hands on these men and, and, and commissioned them to do the special work. Not, I mean, all of us, you guys all know that you're all priests and you're supposed to be telling people about Jesus. Right? You know that, right? Right. But there's a special work as a leader. It's not everybody that's doing this, but there's a special work that God has called through His Holy Spirit these men to do. And I believe with all my heart that He has called these two men to help lead this church. Amen. And so um, I would just ask that you would join me in, in praying first for Jay, and then he'd like to share just a few minutes of what's on his heart, okay? Awesome. Lord, I just, uh, I love this man, and... Um, he is my brother, and he is loved by all of us here, and we know that he loves all of us. Lord, he has faithfully served you for decades, Lord. And Lord, I know from being a senior pastor myself the wars that he's been through. And he's come out hurt, battered, broken, but still fighting. And so, Lord, I pray that this season of his ministry would be the sweetest season, that this would be the fruit of his labor all these years for you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to come alongside and to, to work with him. I pray, Lord, for this congregation to make it easy for him to lead them. I pray your great blessing upon him. And in the spirit of the scriptures, I just now, right now, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, commission this man to be an elder of Revolution Church. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Awesome. And we're going to move on over here. So my brother Ramon, I'd ask that you would do the same thing and pray for this man right now. If you want, if you feel comfortable, you can kind of put your hand up towards him. I don't know if it really makes a difference or not. People do it. You can if you want. There's a non-denominational church. Just pray. Pray with me. 
Father God, we just love you and we love this man. Lord, this man, to, I, I don't know if I'm the, I'm the guy to say it, but Lord, in this man, I see a treasure chest of the Spirit. I am so thankful that you have sent this man to this church. Lord, he has been walking by faith for years now, and he has seen your faithfulness year after year and situation after situation. And we pray, Lord, that he would see your faithfulness in a fresh new way as he takes on a new endeavor here in this church. Lord, we covet his prayers, and so we ask that you would help him to continue to be the man that you've called him to be, to be the man that he's always been, the man that we know, the man who loves us, the man who loves the word of God, the, le the man who leads by example. Lord, I pray your great blessing upon this man. I pray that you would open up the word of God to him in fresh new ways, new revelation, new things, Lord, new things about you that he would discover that would bring joy to his heart. Lord, I also pray that you'd bless him in his new endeavor vocationally. I pray that it would be successful. I pray that your hand would be upon it. And Lord, most importantly, Lord, I pray that you'd bless him in his endeavor here as our small group pastor. Help him to lead. Both of these men, Lord, I pray that you, like Solomon, give them the wisdom. And myself, Lord, give us the wisdom to lead your people and lead them well. Help us to bring them to green pastures where they could feast on you. I thank you. And so, Lord, in the spirit of the scriptures, Lord, I commission this man, Ramon, to be our small group pastor here at Revolution Church. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Awesome. There you go. If these guys just want to take a few minutes and share their heart for the church with you. So, please. <laughs> I need some water, man. Thank you. No problem. I guess what I want to share with you is, is like Moses said, <clears throat> excuse me, when we came in here, I told him, I said, I've been in ministry for 40 odd years and 25 of those was as the pastor of a church with associates and all that. And my, I think my exact words were, I'm not looking for a position. I'm not looking for a job. I just want a place to serve. And Marty and I agreed about that and we talked about that. We talked about what it would be like to be in church, just to be in church, just be here and be, be a member of the congregation. And I was perfectly happy with that. And Felt real good about it until Moses came around the other day and said, hey, I'd like you to look at this. And so after some time of fasting and a whole lot of time of prayer, you know, somebody once said, when we make plans, God laughs. And there's a lot of truth in that because this certainly was nothing that I had ever planned to do. But, you know, I really believe this is God's will for my, my wife, my life and my wife's life. And, when I say we're so happy to become a, a part of the leadership team of Revolution, anybody that's ever been in ministry very long knows that the spouse is a, a vital, viable part of the team. So, and Mac. Uh, and without, Mac. Without her, yeah. I wouldn't and be Mac. able to. And, yeah. and Mac. Okay, and Mac. <laughs> without, without her, I, I don't. He's excited. You know, God brought us together a lot of years ago, and we've been through a lot of ups and a lot of downs, but the best time is yet to come. Amen. And bear with me for a moment. I want to say this. I didn't think I was going to, but I don't know if you can see this shirt or not, but it says twist and grip. That comes from the years when I was racing motorcycles, which hadn't been all that long ago. But that's when all the action happens. It's when you start twisting the grip. Things change. And they change rapidly. And I believe that this is the time to twist the grip. Amen. And a Revelation Church needs to go forward. And I am so humbled and so thankful to be a proud of this, be a part of this team. We covet your prayers daily, guys, and we will do our best to lead as God wills. Thank you all. I'm going to keep this very short. It's not my my place to be up here and, and speaking. I'm comfortable in the back in a corner somewhere. But uh, I'm very grateful for uh, Revolution Church for the family that God is. Uh, assigned me to and uh, very grateful for Moses and Meredith and his family and, and the church family here. So um, like I said, I'm going to keep it short. I'm very blessed and humbled uh, to do this. Not something I was seeking, but uh, you know, something that I've been kind of operating out of for a while now <laughs> unofficially. So um, I just thank you, Moses, and I thank, thank God you. for his faithfulness. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Awesome.
Thank you. <sighs> Praise the Lord. All right, let's talk about this faithful God just a little bit more, okay? What's the name of our series? Faithful, faithful, faithful. faithful. Started last week, and uh, the theology is where we started. We started with the theology of his faithfulness. And, and here's, here's, the, here's the, main, the main thing. There's lots of stuff we talked about, but the main thing is that God will not smear his own name. And so he will always keep his word. That's the anchor of him being faithful. Yes, he loves you. He loves me. He loves every single person on earth that's ever lived and ever will. But that's not the anchor. That's not the main reason why he's faithful. He is faithful because he cannot deny himself. He's, he's just like, well, that's just who I am. Like, what do you want? What, what kind of God do you want me to be, man? I, this is who I am. I can't help myself. I'm faithful. I always keep my word. I'm super, super reliable. I am the Lord, and I do not change. That's what he said. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is always faithful to keep his word. Amen? So uh, last week we got started, and, and uh, we threw some definitions up on the screen for you. Faithful is not a, it's not something that can be defined by a sentence. It's something that can be defined by its synonyms. And you get enough synonyms shoved down your throat, you kind of get the idea of what faithful is. You see them up there on the board. Loyal. To be faithful is constant and steadfast and devoted and unswerving. I love that one. This is who I am. I'm going this way. I'm not going here or there. This is what I'm doing. Trustworthy, committed, dedicated, dependable reliable. We talked a lot about that, right? We need a lot more of that in the Christian church, don't we? Yeah. And, and some of us have been disappointed and disappointed by people who said something, but then they didn't keep their word. And, and maybe, truth be known, maybe that's who you are. Maybe you're the one who needs to work on your faithfulness a little bit. Maybe you've let some people down. Well, we certainly don't get to establish we don't have the right to establish who God is, right? Say, we do not. However, we do get the privilege of establishing in our own mind and figuring this thing out of who God is. We don't get to figure out who He is and tell Him who He is, but we get the privilege to understand in our mind who He is, right? We want to set our minds correctly on who God is. And so... My thought was during this message series that two things would happen. As we figure out who God is, the theology and the practical of it, that we would learn to trust God more, right? In, in, in more things and, and in greater, deeper levels, right? I, 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 it's easy to say, I trust you with my eternity, because we don't really see eternity right here, right now, right? That's coming someday, but I'm, I'm talking about right here, right now. It's easy to trust someone with something that's going to happen maybe, maybe, someone say maybe. maybe, maybe years from now, but it might not. It might be tomorrow, right? could be today. I'm not here to scare you. I'm just saying. We all watch the news. It's easy to trust in, in something that's going to happen maybe 10 or 20 years from now because there's no risk in that. But what about right here, right now? What about in your relationships, in your finances, in your vocation, with your family, with your kids, with your church, whatever it is that you're involved with right now? God wants you to trust him more right now with more things. There's areas of all of our lives that we do not trust God. We don't. I don't. And I got a microphone on, yo. There's things I don't trust him with. And the truth is, I say I do, but my actions, right? All of us are all guilty. And so God wants us to learn to trust him more. Now, because Christ followers, come on, because Christ followers, right, since we want to trust him more because he's faithful, the second objective here is that we would be able to be trusted by other people more. Right? That, that's what we're looking for. That's the practical. You, if you can figure out that God is super faithful, but it doesn't change who you are, epic failure. 
So, so we want to be, we want to trust God more, and we want others to trust us more. So the first step was the theology of God's faithfulness. It's bottom line this. What's the Bible say about God's faithfulness? What is he? Really, it's what does God say about his own faithfulness? That's this, right? This is God's word, and it is true, and it's authored by the Holy Spirit. So the theology is, what does God say about his own faithfulness? So we studied that last week, kind of in detail. I hope it was helpful. It was helpful for me. Here's the second step, though. We want to examine his faithfulness in action. We, we see what it says, you know, I am the Lord and I do not change. Well, let's see it. Do you ever have a friend say, I'm going to do this? Yeah, let's see. Yeah, I want, yeah right. Put it down in writing. Shake my hand. <laughs> right? Because people talk a lot. I am Moses and I do not change. Oh, really? I am the Lord. I do not change. Well, I want to see it in action. So the theology is, is I want, I'm not going to smear my, my reputation, so I'm always going to do what I say I'm going to do. Well, let's see. So the second step, again, is to examine his faithfulness in action. So we're going to spend some weeks, five, six, seven weeks. I don't know yet. That's up to the Holy Spirit. We'll see how he leads me in that. But we're going to spend some weeks looking at famous stories in the Scriptures. Stories that you have, if you know anything about the Bible, you... We're going to talk about Abraham tonight. Father Abraham. <laughs> I'm getting used to doing this, y'all. So just, you were here Sunday, right? Come on, now y'all know what I'm talking about. Sunday, folks. Yeah, oh yeah. <clears throat> Can I tell you a story? I, I told this before, but it's the best story ever. And some of you weren't here before. I see some new faces. Best of the highlight reel. Best highlight reel ever of crazy stuff that went on in the church since I started. At the, new, at the old building. The old building. You know, the old building, right? So the little building down in Fort, I'm preaching. I am preaching my little heart out right there. And this lady with her granddaughter leaves her seat. She's sitting right around here. And she plops her baby down right on the floor, starts changing its diaper. Right there. While I'm trying to preach. And a close second this last Sunday, you guys were here. Awesome. So, anyway, we're gonna, let's get back on track. Squirrel. So, so we're going to spend some weeks talking about some famous characters in Scripture. And, and listen, if you, are a, if you are a complete atheist in here, and you've never been to church, first of all, super glad that you're here. That's awesome. But you've heard of Abraham. And you've heard of all these people that we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks in Scripture, but we want to look at it with fresh eyes. We're going to talk about these huge stories with huge miracles, but not to elevate the miracle, but to look at the faithfulness of the miracle worker. That's what we're going to do for the next five, six, seven. So I'm going to do this. I want to take you back in time just a little bit as we, as we venture in. You guys ready to venture in? Yeah. You ready to jump in? Okay. So I want to take you back to February 22nd, 1980, Lake Placid, New York, Winter Olympics. Here's a little backstory first before we watch. The Soviet Union was the dominant hockey team worldwide. They won everything. And we don't win anything. We got some good players, but we're not that good. And they just, Soviet Union just wins and wins and wins. And it was a foregone conclusion that the Soviet Union was gonna win Yet again. This is called the miracle on ice. Feast your eyes on this. Make sure it's loud. Still, now Petrov controls. Back to Parlamov. Skating in on the left side. Into the American end. 55 seconds. But Mikhailov has the puck. Mikhailov sweeping in. Out in front. Backhander goes wide. I think Craig might have got a just a piece of it. Mikhailov. Back out to Billy Legendov. 43 seconds remaining. Check into the boards, it comes back to center ice. 38, 37 seconds left in the game. Petrov with it, the Americans on top, four to three. Long shot, Craig able to get a piece of it to sweep it away. 28 seconds, the crowd going insane. Carlamon, shooting it into the American end again. Morrow is back there. Now Johnson, 19 seconds. Johnson over to Ramsey. 
The Legendov gets checked by Ramsey. McClanahan is there. The puck is still loose. 11 seconds. You've got 10 seconds. The countdown going on right now. Morrow up to Silk. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Awesome, right? These guys, they're animals, right? They kill each other. They have no teeth. They just assume go across the ice and just start wailing on those guys. But they're in awe. I mean, I've never seen that before. That's, listen, honestly, right now, how many people got goosebumps just now? Awesome, right? I've watched that thing like 10 times this week. I know what's going to happen. And I still got it just now. It was awesome. Just absolutely. The, the best part, though, is the Russian team just like, <laughs> they just can't believe, did this really just happen just now? It was incredible. I think, honestly, that that is, and I grew up in Massachusetts, the Celtics, and Johnny Most, and Havlicek stole the ball, and Larry Burr, all this stuff, but I think that Al Michaels call was the greatest moment in sports history. I, I just, I, I, every time he says, do you believe in me? I just lose it, man. Just awesome. I'm not even a hockey fan. <clears throat> Well, I'm not quite sure that that event qualifies as a miracle. You know, it was cool. It was big. It's a big standalone event that we should remember. I don't know if it's like a miracle, you know, like the opening of the Red Sea or anything, but it's definitely an awesome event. It was a, it was a good win, right? I mean, isn't that what we're, that's what they were celebrating. They, they, were, they, they weren't, they were celebrating the win. They weren't, they weren't like, going crazy because they, they, they tried real hard. Well, they only lost by one, man. The defense was really good. They held them to, to only three goals, but we only had two. So, woo, no. The reason why it was so awesome is because they won, right? It's because they won, and they shouldn't have. So in that sense, that's why it says, do you believe in miracles? Like, it shouldn't have happened, but it did. But what's better than a win and celebrating the win is, is consistent. I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if, if the American team after that, just that was just who they became. They just won all the time, right? That would be incredible. We would want that. Would we want that? Of course we'd want that. Right? that, that constant, consistent victory is the goal. That's the best thing. So, so we're not going to be studying God's miracle, isolated what he did kind of a thing. But better, we're going to be studying God's miracle upon miracle upon miracle that screams, I'm faithful. It's not what he did, it's who he is. Right? That's, when we see God doing something, it's because he's faithful to himself. And he's faithful to his character. And he's faithful to his word. The miracles are good, for sure. But miracle after miracle after miracle, God invading the space, he does this, he does that. It just displays his faithfulness. And that's what we're looking for here in this series. So the word faithful has synonyms as a definition. But the word faithfulness, I took the liberty of coming up with a definition for you. And I hope that you'll jot this down. I think it's very, very helpful. I think it's accurate and good. Not propping myself. I just think it's consistent with God's word. I say that faithfulness is this. It's a consistent pattern of reliability displayed over time. It's a consistent pattern of reliability displayed over time. It's just who he is. And that's what we're looking for. Is God faithful or does he just say he is? I mean, at the Bible, we shared that last week just over and over and over again, verse after verse. God's saying, I'm faithful, I'm faithful. You can trust me, you can trust me. Is God just saying that? Is it, is it what God did or is it who God is? That's what we're looking for. And so I want to invite you to open up your Bible, my favorite time of the night, right? Open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Now while you're turning there, I just want to tell you that 
I'm not going to, to read to you uh, Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis chapter 25 because that right there, that's the story of Abraham. And I would invite you to read that at some point because it's awesome. And you should. And you would learn and you would grow. But I'm not going to do that tonight. What I'm going to do is I'm going to skim through some important sections of Scripture in chapters 12, 13, 15, and 17. Now listen, I need you to be patient with me because it's going to take a little bit of work to get to where we want to go. But if you're hungry and you want to learn and you want to grow, stay in your seat. Okay? So give me the grace to do that. Now, before I jump into the, and, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to even, I'm going to go through it super fast, and I'm just going to highlight some stuff that I highlighted in my Bible. But before we go into the details of this interaction with God and Abraham, I want you to look right here first, right at chapter 12, right at the beginning. This is the foundation of the whole conversation, the whole experience that God has with Abraham. It's right here. 12.1, the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. Abraham, have faith. That's what he's telling him. I want you to have faith. In the, in the coming chapters, Abraham, I'm going to be downloading into you dozens of, of I wills. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do this. and I'm going to, I, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Tons of them. And I want you to have faith that I will do my I wills. Do you understand? Everything that God is about to say to him is in the future. And he wants Abraham to trust him that these I wills will actually happen. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of what we can't see. So, so when God comes, right, it's the, it's the, it's going to happen. It's, it's when God comes to you and says, uh, Don, seek first my kingdom, Don. That means I want you to go after me. The, 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 num the number one thing of your life, the thing you give quickest and mostest and, and readily to this thing is pursuing your relationship with me. And then I want you to pursue other people so that my kingdom will grow. Like, I want first and best. That's, that your major resources should go to that before your job, your family, everything. This is what I want, Don. And, and I, know what you, well, I know what you need, Don. And if you'll do this, I'll give you everything you need. And, and, and faith, the, the evidence, the reality of, of what we hope for is the, oh, I know it's going to happen. It's, it's when Don says, I know it's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but God said it, so it's going to happen. That's faith, right? That's the evidence of what's hoped for. When people look at you and you say, let me tell you something. God said it. You can bank on it. It's going to happen. That, when someone says, can you prove the existence of God? Yeah, I can. He said it, and it's going to happen. You watch. And then when it happens, they have nothing to say. That's faith, right? And that faith comes, your faith comes, my faith comes, and it relies completely on God's faithfulness. You can't have faith in someone who's let you down, right? And so, so he, he, here's the thing. I can move forward in confidence if I can look back and see consistency, right? That, that's, that's, that's faithful. I can have faith and I can move forward in confidence trusting in this God who said, I'm going to do this if I can look back and see a pattern over time of consistent reliability on his behalf. If you had a financial advisor and you went to that financial advisor and you said, Susan went up to him and, hey, listen, I, got a, I'm, I have $100,000. I need you to, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. $100,000. I'm going to pick up this. Is that okay? And I want you to invest in that. And you say, oh, I'm the best invest person. I know what to do and I know what to do. And she lost that. And it went, right? And then she got 
fortunate again and she's come up with another hundred thousand dollars and and here's her advisor I, listen I'm telling you I know I know what to do with this money and so okay say it with me yeah can she look back and see consistent performance here so she's not going to want to, if she is so lucky, to use that word, can I use that word lucky in church? Don't judge me. Don't judge me, Tori. So if she's so lucky to get another hundred grand, is she going to go there again? No. No, she's going to call someone else. I can move forward with confidence if I can look back and see consistency. And so let's take a look at God's record. We know what he says about himself, that he's faithful, that you can trust him. But let's just see if he can back up his words, okay? So, like I said, I'm going to skim. Genesis 12, I'm going to do my best to just skim along and read some of these things to you. These are the I, some of the I wills. Certainly not going to be a comprehensive list, not going to hit them all. But he says to uh, Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And all the families on earth will be blessed through you. He goes down to um, verse 6 and says that he settled in next to the oak of Mora. Uh, oak trees grow in fertile land, don't they? Yeah, they don't grow in the desert. They grow in fertile land. So he gets there. That's kind of good. And he says, I'll give you this land. I'll give this land to your descendants. And so Abraham built an altar there. And then he built another altar in another place. Can I just pause there and say that I said a moment ago that it's, we can move forward with confidence if we can look back and see consistency. That's what altars are. You, know, you, can, you build these things and they're a reminder of what God did. Of what he said, what he did. He was good to me here. And I remember that. It's so good. We might not build an altar with rocks and stuff to remember the Lord, but maybe you have a journal. Maybe it's just good to look back and see the times that he's been faithful to you so that when the next opportunity to be, to, to be faithless presents itself, you can look back at a, at a history of consistency on God's behalf and go, you know what? I can move forward with confidence because he's good to me. And you remember those things. So when someone says, that's in the past, just forget the past. Not always. Maybe you forget the past of the things that you've been forgiven of. That's awesome. Say amen. amen. Right? God's, he's for, he doesn't even know what you're talking about. Oh, Lord, I know you forgave me about that, but I feel badly about it. What are you talking about, kid? I can't remember what I've already forgiven you. What are you talking about? Did you do something new? Amen. He wouldn't say that. He knows. That was a joke. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> so, so, so it's good to, to, to build some altars in a sense. That's what is happening here. He wants to remember Verse 10, at the time, a severe famine struck the land, forcing Abram to go down to Egypt. There's a situation here with the Pharaoh. Chapter 13, same place where Abram had built the altar, and there he worshipped the Lord again. Issue with Lot. Get some promises here for you. Chapter 13, verse 14. After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, Look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south and east and west. <laughs> I read that and I say, Man, we are stubborn people. He said every direction, but he has to spell it out for us. I'm giving all this land as far as you can see, to you and your descendants. Descendants means he's got to have a kid. You can't have a million until you have one, correct? As a permanent possession. And I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. Mm. Chapter 15, it says, uh, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. 
verse 4, you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Hadn't had a son. That could be his heir. To inherit his riches. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can, which you cannot. That's how many descendants you will have. I am the Lord, verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. Verse 18 of chapter 15. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. Chapter 17, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him again and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. This is my covenant with you, verse 4. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. I will no longer, it will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and, remember this, and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. Then Sarah, his wife, gets involved. God says to Abraham, remember regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai from now. Her name is Sarah, and I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. Promise after promise after promise. So if you go through what I just read, you're going to see, if unofficially, you're going to see about five separate conversations that God has with Abraham. And in those promises, those conversations, you see that there's really one promise made that kind of summarizes all of it. It's wrapped up in this word nation. He said, I'm going I'm to I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you into a nation. As a matter of fact, nations. Well, so if you break that down, what is that? It's, 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 it's land. It's territory, right? Think about a nation. It's, it's a territory, and then it's the people. Am I, am I right? Are we tracking? Okay, it's the land, and it's the people. So Abraham... I'm going to give you lots of land. I'm going to give you lots of people. I'm going to make you a nation, territory and population. Have faith that this will happen, Abraham. Well, here's the deal. How many people in this room are 75 years old or older? Raise your hand. One. Okay. All right. One. One. Um, let me ask you this. No one's, only one person in the room is that age that, that Abraham was. But, but how many people... Okay, how, how many people in this room feel like they've lived 75 years, right? And how many people have lived believing in something that, it, that God has told them would happen and it just hasn't happened yet? Come on. Abraham went 75 years 75 years, and all of a sudden, God comes to him and says, I'm going to do something new in your life. I'm going to make you the start of a great nation. What? What, what, what was that, Lord? Yeah, I'm going to make you the, I'm going to, I'm going to make a nation through you. And so after 75 years of no nation, 
He's just earning a living. He's got his family. But in faith, he's moving forward. And in faith, he's moving toward this thing of a nation based on nothing except God's promise. And that's what God has asked you to do. But, right? But, but, life is not easy. And what you're about to see in Scripture is your life. God's promised some things to you, right? You know, God, Jesus said, I came, you might have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Like, you'd have a good life. But we don't always experience that thing, right? It's, it's great to get up here and say, John 10, 10, but I don't want to yell it out too much because some of us are not having a really good life right now. You, 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 you want to trust in God, but the, the, the truth is, is that your life is kind of crappy compared to what you thought it should be when you read the scriptures. So I don't want to just, you know, yell it all out because some of us aren't feeling that right now. Well, see, here's Abraham, and he's been promised all kinds of amazing things from God. He says, I want you to have faith. Okay, I'll have faith. So you start moving, right? God tells you to do something, so you start moving. You start moving. You start moving. But, but, chapter 12, verse 10, there's a famine in the land. So he moves. He doesn't even know where he's supposed to go yet. But he goes there, and he finally settles in, and all of a sudden, there's a famine. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second, Lord. You told me that I was going to have this great possession of land, and it was going to be the start of a nation, and now there's a famine. Distraction. You know, you're moving in the right direction. You're walking by faith. And, and, and then all of a sudden, wham! Something comes into your life, and it's, it's a distraction. It's an obstruction. It's a delay. It's a famine, man. And maybe, you, maybe you, you're not in a famine. Like, we're in, America, we're, in a, we're in America, right? There's no famine here. Right? The, it's fertile land, and, and we have lots of crops. But maybe, maybe that's not your word. Maybe, maybe it's a spiritual famine, Right? Maybe, maybe you used to walk with the Lord like so close and it was a vibrant, healthy relationship and you were serving the Lord and you were blessing the Lord and you were worshiping the Lord and then you find yourself showing up once in a while and, and you run away from the offering plate and someone says help and you don't want to do that and, and someone says pray and Patty says, come in at five in the morning. You're like, you're out of your stinking gourd. I would never do that. But there was a day that you used to do that and if someone said when you got saved, hey, come in at 5 o'clock, you'd be there at 4.30. Because you're so eager. Maybe you're in that famine. Maybe you're in a relational famine. It's just not going well with your spouse. Maybe it used to be awesome. Listen, I've been there, man. And we go through seasons of famine. We have vocational famines. We have financial famines. These things where you felt like God promised you something amazing and you had faith in it and you believed it, so you started moving toward it in obedience and all of a sudden there's a famine. And Abraham experienced that. Will you still trust me, Abraham? 1219, this is sick. Say, this is sick. Pharaoh steals his wife. But it's because Abraham is a coward. Right? A coward. So he's got this hot wife, right? I got a hot wife. I understand how he feels. So he goes into, into Egypt because of the stupid famine. And he's like, listen, you're so hot that all these guys are going to want you. And if I like, come to your defense, they're going to kill me and take you anyway. So I'll just pretend. Let's just tell them you're my sister. So the Pharaoh, because he can do whatever he wants, they think he's a god. He thinks he's a god. He's like, oh, she's hot. I'll take her. Listen, he made her his wife. That doesn't mean they had a wedding, y'all. Okay, this is ancient Israel and Egypt we're talking about. That means, oh, she's nice, let's go to the tent. That's what's happening. The Pharaoh doesn't go, oh, you're just so nice, why don't you come hang out with me? Right? Let's just mature thinkers here for a second. You know what's going on. Now the promise is that he's going to have descendants with her, right? That they're going to have a child, but now... She's sleeping with the most powerful person on the planet. And if he says a word, off with your head. What's going to happen to the promise, God? Is it dead? Is it dead? I don't know. I was living in faith. And then all of a sudden, right, we get these things that drop into our faith path, don't we? All the time. Chapter 13, 6, 7, chapter 13, 10, 11. This is the story of him and Lot. 
they're pretty wealthy guys. Things are going pretty good. They got lots of livestock and, and, and good land. And, right, and here's the promise. You're going to be fruitful. You're going to be a blessed man. Everything's going to go well. You're going to have a lot of big family. You're going to have big land. And then all of a sudden, he's, it says that there's turmoil with strife within the family. Because they got all this livestock, and, and you got some livestock, and I got some livestock, but I've been promised by God that I'm going to have all this land, but all of a sudden we're fighting, and you take your, your sheep and your goats, and you're like, I'm out of here. Oh, and by the way, I'm taking all your good land. Really? How is that going to work? You, God, you made a promise to me. And now all of a sudden, my nephew, who I love, I kind of brought him up, right? I taught him a trade. I taught him how to take care of this stuff. I taught him how to, to, and now he's taken, it says he went and took all the land along the, the shore of the Jordan. It said that it looked like the Garden of Eden. So I'm thinking, man, that's my promised land. That's my, that's what you promised me that, Lord. And now Lot's taking all the good land. Like, things aren't going well here, man. Right? And then when you get to chapter 15, verse 1, God looks at him. All the stuff's going on. He said, yeah, um, Abraham, don't be afraid. I'll protect and reward you. Really? Really? Because you made some promises about land and a kid. Okay, all my good land he just stole from me. He took it all. And the Pharaoh's sleeping with my wife. Really? You're going to reward me and protect me? Aren't we like this? Come on now, right? We want to believe but things come into our life and we're like, all bets are off, God. You, you said, and this is not. And Look at chapter 15, verse 2. Abraham looks at God and says, oh, sovereign Lord. So it's not like he's doubting his existence, right? He's just got some doubt. And, and is, isn't it okay to have some doubt? I mean, God does, he wants to purge that out of you, but, but isn't it okay to be healthy enough to just, I mean, God has big shoulders, man. And, and I think it's okay to just come to him and just say, hey, listen, Lord, here's my doubts. I, I, he still calls him sovereign Lord. So what's that mean? I know you can get through this, Lord. Nothing's too tall or big and bad for you. So you can get through this, but I'm just telling you right now, like you make, read it, you're making me all these promises, but what good are they if I got no kid? It's never going to happen. Let's be practical, Lord. You made a promise, and it's not working. She's sleeping with the Pharaoh. I can't even say anything. Like, what's going on here, man? 24 years, he heard these promises, and for 24 years, he wants to believe it. But after 24 years, still no promised son and still no promised land. Ah! Being a nation is not looking real good right now. Are we there? All of us? Right? Seek first the kingdom of God, Don. I know what you need. Put me first and I'm telling you, you'll have everything you need. What about this guy? I'm telling you, Abraham, just, just go, and I'm going to make you an awesome nation. Well, it's not happening. I will, I will, I will, I will. All future, all faith, 24 years of I will has Abraham in a mindset of, great, you will, I wait, and really, I wonder. I wonder if maybe I didn't hear you correctly, right? Maybe I read the wrong verse. Maybe I read it in the wrong context. You promised something here, Lord, but maybe, I, maybe that Bible study wasn't... I wonder if God forgot me. Because people have. We create God in our, in our image, don't we? So, so people have forgotten. They said they were going to do something. They said, I promise to do this. And, and they forgot. So, Lord, maybe you just, you know, maybe you just forgot. You're busy. You know, you got planets and stuff you're spinning on your fingers. And maybe you just got busy. And I wonder if God changed his mind. People do that too. So we would impose that on the Lord as well sometimes. Maybe God decided he, he just made a different plan. 
I wonder if God is, maybe he's just unable. You know, maybe, maybe his glorious unlimited resources that the scripture talks about, maybe they're not so glorious. And maybe they're not so unlimited as the scriptures would say. I wonder, because he promised and it's been 24 years and it's still not happening. I wonder if he is just unable to follow through with his word. It hasn't happened so long that I wonder if God even cares. And worst, worst yet, I wonder if God is. Look at verse 8, chapter 15. God makes him some more promises after verse 2. And in verse 8, he's like, Oh, sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I'll actually possess this? Aren't we all there? Right? Stuff happens. You think there's a promise. You think your life's going to be this way and it's just not working. And so, yeah, I got doubt. But you know, if this says anything, it says Abraham still honored and respected who God was, called him sovereign Lord. But he also came with him, came genuine and just said, listen, I, I want to believe you, man, but I'm just, I'm having some doubts. Can you just please help me with that? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And, and you, don't, you don't see that he's punished. David, in the Psalms, he did this constantly. Like, I love you, Lord, you're amazing, but why have you forgotten me? And how long is it going to be till you help me? And, but you're awesome and I praise you. Habakkuk did the same thing. Can I side note for a second? Sometimes faithfulness comes in a way that's not so pretty. Faithfulness is just, God said he's going to do something and he does it. Can it be something that we perceive as bad too? I just want to open up that area of your mind just to think, because we think God's faithfulness, I came, you want to have life and have it abundantly, that means health, wealth, you know, all the good stuff, and it's going to be great, and it's not always like that. I would just say faithfulness means he said it, it will. And after this conversation right here, <laughs> just a few verses later, verse 12, as the sun was going down, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and a terrifying darkness came down over him. Then the Lord said to Abram, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years, but I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and in the end, they will come away with great wealth. Hundreds of years later, in Egypt, as slaves, for 400 years, and when they left, Egypt was throwing their gold and silver. Get out of here, please. Faithful. He said it, it is. Okay? So after he doubts, then there's some more promises, more land, more descendants. We read those. Well, then finally over in chapter 21, you can go there if you want. Finally, the, the promised son, the, this, this son that was promised so that all the descendants could start to happen. He's born. It says here in verse 5, Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. So that's the other big announcement. Jay and Marty are expecting. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Woo! So finally, Isaac is born, right, at 100 years old. So now it's, it was 24 years of waiting, and now it happened. So 25 years of waiting for this to happen and wading through all the challenges and the, diver and, the, and, the, and, the, and the distractions and the obstructions and the famine and, and sleeping with the Pharaoh, you know, all this, he's wading through all that, and finally it happens. Awesome news, right? So I'm walking in faith, and finally it happens. Okay, I can forget the past. Okay, this was rough, but okay, awesome. So listen, have you ever been walking by faith, and you're starting to make some progress, everything's going really, really good, and then you get knocked down again? Come on. Everyone in the room, right? Everyone. Everyone. 
God promises. And you have faith to believe. And then the famine comes. And then the Pharaoh steals your wife. And then you got family problems. And you lose all the land. But you get through it. And somehow you just you wade through this thing and you hold on to the Lord and He delivers you and you get through it and you start thinking, man, okay, I weathered the storms and now I'm good. And then boom, again. Everyone in this room. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Chapter 21, 22 is the boom. Chapter 22 is the insane boom. Chapter 22, the kid is born. It doesn't say how old he was in chapter 22 but that he was actually carrying wood on his back, I'd say he's probably not Jackson's age, but probably a 10, 12, 13, 14-year-old kid. And this is the boom. The boom is God says, I want you to take your son, and I want you to take him up the mountain that I will show you. Again, Abraham, go in faith, because you don't really know where I want you to go yet, but you'll, you'll see, when you get there, you're going you're gonna to know. I'm going to make it known to you. So live by faith. I want you to take your son up there and I want you to sacrifice him to me. You think you had a bad day? Right? Boss was breathing down your neck. Wife's hollering at you. Kids are misbehaving. Your husband's not doing what he said he would do. How about putting your kid on an altar to burn him? But that's what God says to do. Now, hold on a second here. Wait a minute. You promised me land and you promised me descendants and that it would blossom and be fruitful and become nations, and that all the people of the earth would be blessed through me. How is this going to happen if I'm going to kill this kid where it's all supposed to happen through? Crazy. I just want to read some of it to you. Take you to the mountain which I will show you. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. Carry your own wood, man that you're going to be burned on. While he, Abraham himself, carried the fire and the knife. Imagine being that dad. You've waited a hundred years, a hundred years for this awesome miracle. And now you're walking up the mountain with the knife in your hand that you're going to kill your own kid with. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son, Isaac, and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, say, God is faithful. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes, here I am. Don't lay a hand on that boy. <laughs> Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its, thorns, by its horns in the thorns. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. What started about, I guess, guessing on Isaac's age, about 35 years before, God says, Abraham, have faith in my faithfulness. And now this has gone 35 years and has now come full circle. And all of God's I wills are on the line big time right here. Abraham, do you still have faith in my faithfulness? See, the other things were hills. The other things were, were just distractions, but now i got a mountain in front of me, Lord. This is the death of the promise right here. This is the, this is the problem with no solution. But Abraham, do you still trust me? Do you believe I will be faithful to my word? And your faith and my faith and Abraham's faith and everyone's faith in God 
rests squarely on God's faithfulness because God, and we've all been there, if you don't come through in this thing right here, I'm done. I'm done. And that's Abraham right now with his son. All the promises of God on the table, all the distractions, everything, it's all right here and it's coming to an end right here. Do you believe? The last thing I said. He took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of. It's the three biggest words of the night. In place place of. The ram is a substitutionary sacrifice that moved the mountain. A mountain that could not be moved by anything else. God solves Abraham's unsolvable problem. God is faithful. God is faithful. See, if Isaac dies, Null and void, all the promises. It's done. And then he ruins his reputation. He's not going to have that, is he? This story might sound familiar. See, you got a mountain. <laughs> and I had a mountain. We all have a mountain. It's called sin. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. No keeping the law is going to fix it. No doing good deeds is going to make you good enough. You can bring your best, and the mountain will not move. So God brings you a mountain mover in his son, Jesus Christ. He brings his best, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And the mountain is gone for everyone who would embrace him by faith. So i got to ask you, have you received the substitute? Have you received this substitute yet? So you belong on a cross, but Jesus takes your place. Has Jesus taken your place on your cross yet? If not, don't wait. Today is the day of salvation. So here's, here's how we wrap this thing up right here. Brass tacks. Rubber meets the road right here. Story's great. God's faithful. Can you and I have faith in God's faithfulness? Is God faithful? See, that's the question that we have to ask. Is God faithful? Well, God promised Abraham that he would father a nation, right? Didn't he? Do me a favor. Last thing I want you to do tonight before we sing to this amazing faithful God. Go to Matthew, the first Gospel, first book of the, we went from the first book of the Old Testament, now look in the first book of the New Testament, and look at verse 2. God promised Abraham that he would father a nation, right? Matthew chapter 1, verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac. And the father of this, and the father of all the way down, all the way down, all the way down to verse 16, and Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says that all God's promises are yes in Christ. Look at He was promised a nation. Jesus Christ is the king. Two and a half billion people. This is the proof that his promise is good. Two and a half billion people worldwide and growing every single day. And I don't even know how many people have been Christians since the church began 2,000 years ago. Billions and billions of people, and they're spread all over the world. That's pretty good land. So his promise came to pass. Started with Abraham all the way through to Mary to Jesus. We now have a king as promised to Abraham. We now have land that's been promised to Abraham. And we have a people that is promised to Abraham. Listen, God is faithful. If he said it, you can trust it. Amen? Amen. Let's rise to our feet. Let's rise to our feet. Come on, church. Saturday night, church. Rise to your feet. Let's sing to the Lord. Listen, let's pray and then let's sing to the Lord. You guys want to pray with me?
Okay, listen. If you believe that God is faithful, just raise your hand and let him know. Let him look down and see that you believe. Right now, that's your declaration. That you believe that God is faithful. That when he has said something to you, no matter what happens, no matter what distractions, no matter what kind of famines, no matter what kind of distractions or obstructions come your way, that he will Keep his word. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for tonight. I thank you for this message. I thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, I'm remembering right now some of the times in my life that I was done if you didn't deliver and you came through. You are faithful. You are faithful. You are faithful. And Lord, we praise you and we worship you tonight. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, that you are a faithful God, that we could trust you. And when the word says, seek first my kingdom of God and that you'll give us everything that we need in the seeking, we can trust that you will. So Lord, help us to trust you more and help others to trust us more as we endeavor to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing to the Lord. Come on.